Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and I was actually gonna release this video to coincide with Falcon and the Winter Soldier episode number one, just kind of taking a shot because I didn't really know if John Walker was going to appear in that series. I'm kind of glad I didn't, not so much because John Walker didn't appear, he did, uh, but because of the fact that it would have been a massive spoiler in hindsight. So, <laughs> uh, what I wanna do is go ahead and release this now, since John Walker's kind of the character a lot of people are gonna be talking about. And so when it comes to him, John Walker first appeared in Captain America Comics issue number 323, and he was created by Mark Grunewald, but something that I I want to talk about here for a second is the nature of Captain America comics at the time, because to understand the significance of John Walker, you kind of have to understand Captain America. The idea was that the, the last significant writer Captain America had before Mark Grunewald showed up was Roger Stern and John Byrne. And of course, John Byrne was the artist, Roger Stern was the writer. And while their run only lasted about nine issues, it was a pretty fun and adventurous run. The issue with this is that Captain America stories, especially following Roger Stern's completion, when all you really had was just a series of interim writers, right? Chris Claremont, Jim Shooter, Al Milgram, there wasn't really a whole lot going on with this character. And for a long, long time, Captain America was just kind of facing off against the villains of the week. And the only thing that really kept Captain America comics alive was the fact that it was Captain America, right? The name recognition. It was one of those things where Stanley and Jack Kirby brought him back in Avengers number four with a bit of a tease in a previous story where it actually turned out to be a villain by the name of Acrobat or something along those lines. And, and the result was that people wanted to see him come back. But it was difficult to write a story about Captain America that didn't didn't involve him facing off against some sort of threat against the United States, right? So you had him facing off against forces during the Cold War. You had him facing off against Iran in the 70s. It was one of those, those you know, weird and wonky situations. And so when Mark Grunewald took over the title, the desire of Mark was to basically create villains or characters that Captain America could fight that were wholly Captain America villains, right? To basically give him his own rogues gallery, which is something that he never really had. And that's why US agent John Walker proved to be so popular in his initial outing because he was kind Kind of the antithesis to Steve Rogers. Now, the reality is that unlike a lot of writers today, back then in the 1970s and the 1980s, especially when you got to 86 with Captain America 323, that the, the nature of writing comics was to play the long game. And it hadn't always been that way, right? You go and you read Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, it's just kind of like, you know, things are happening, right? And the way that you see comics happen now is actually very reminiscent of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. But because of the popularity, and I kind of hate to see, you know, to keep kind of harping on this, but it really is a true statement, because of the popularity of Chris Claremont and the X-Men and the idea that playing the long game and building characters up is more of a soap opera type story focusing on the character development and maybe secondary focusing on like the crazy events going on that this was kind of adopted almost universally across Marvel comics which is one of the reasons why Marvel became so astronomically popular in the late 1970s going throughout the entirety of the 1980s and especially in the early to mid 1990s and so the result of this is that in his original appearance in Captain America 323 we didn't really know much about John Walker he was simply just going by the name of the super Super Patriot and basically discredited Captain America, right? Arguing that he essentially was the guy who really understood what America was supposed to be about. Now, a lot of this was Mark Grunewald kind of taking like the current state of America at the time, a lot of the issues that America had and using Super Patriot to paint this picture that Captain America just wasn't really doing enough, right? Captain America was out of touch. And that was a great way to segue into John Walker because for anybody who was sitting down and reading Captain America or getting into comics at the time, one of the base questions they had, even if it only came from a place of being intrigued, was how does a man who's been frozen in ice for a few decades somehow come back and remain relevant in the modern era, right? He hasn't really seen society progress. But this was also kind of capitalized on Mark Grunewald by basically saying that Captain America's ideologies and what he stands for are basically timeless, right? That they 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 stand the test of time no matter what era society is living in, right? So kind of using it to maintain the nature of what Steve Rogers stood for. And so the result of this is that the story is pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it was literally just a series of, of campaigns to discredit Steve. Rogers, and that's really all you get from his character, right? You don't really get a whole lot doing there. Instead, what we have from his origin comes from a couple different places. It comes from some follow-up stories that took place in Captain America, specifically in issue 328, as well as the current run of US Agent, which Marvel's released to coincide with the revelation that US Agent is in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, right? To kind of build on the popularity of the show. And so focusing on Captain America 328 and 329 with a little bit of involvement from the current US Agent story by Christopher Priest, which isn't really, isn't 
hasn't really completed. What we know is that he is, uh, he's a guy who was born in Georgia and basically idolized his brother who was a helicopter pilot. But the reality is that his younger brother ended up killing himself, right? Ended up taking his own life. Now that really is more of a way for Christopher Priest to tie into the idea that those individuals who fight in war have these lingering mental issues that, that follow them long after those wars are completed. But the reality of this is that John Walker was always inspired to live up to his brother's memory. Now this is a stark contrast to the way the character was originally depicted in Marvel Comics, which is to say that much like the Punisher, that John Walker idolized Captain America. And just kind of an aside here, for those of you guys who don't know about that, one of the things that was established during Civil War is that Frank Castle went to go fight in Vietnam because he wanted to be like Captain America, right? That he idolized him. That he saw Captain America as just kind of like this, this sort of walking, talking, uh, you know, concept of what great American ideals stand for, right? He just takes it to the most extreme and kills villains, regardless of what they're doing. Uh, it's one of these, these, <laughs> one of those twisted moments about the, the Punisher. But the reality is that John Walker grew up idolizing his brother. And as a result of that, wanted to follow in his brother's footsteps. And he wanted to basically be a quote unquote hero. And so what ended up happening is that in the current US agent run, it ties into what we saw in Captain America 328 and 329, where John Walker basically approached somebody who was called the Power Broker. Now the Power Broker is a guy, it's really kind of a, a company called Power Broker Incorporated that was run by a couple guys named Carl Mollis and Curtis Jackson. And the whole idea behind this is that if you had the money, you could go to the power broker and he would give you powers, right? He would he would literally give you superhero abilities. Now, what John Walker got was effectively enhancements that put him on par with Steve Rogers, right? Enhanced strength, speed, agility, different things like that. And there were limitations to what the power broker could do. He couldn't give you the power to like alter reality on a universal scale or something along those lines, right? There were basically limits there. But what ended up happening is John Walker intended to go forward and join what was called the Universal Class Wrestling Federation. And Instead, he was convinced in order to become a hero. And so the, the only real way he knew to do this was to kind of go forward and then start questioning Captain America's role and establishing himself as almost a replacement the way that Mark Grunewald had basically written him. The reality is that with the original introduction of John Walker, while I wouldn't say it was met with resounding success and people were just like, man, this guy's amazing, you know, there certainly was some intrigue. A lot of, a lot of it because of the fact that we just didn't know enough about him, right? So people were just curious about the character and they wanted to see uh, how far this would go. And so what you ended up getting was Mark Grunewald following up with Captain America number 332, which introduced this idea that, that with the, the Commission on Superhuman Activities, which those of you guys who don't know what that is, the Commission on Superhuman Activities was, was almost kind of a counterpart to Project Wide Awake. Where Project Wide Awake focused on containing and controlling the mutant threat that existed out there, the Commission on Superhero Activities had a liaison named Valerie Cooper, who basically worked alongside the federal government and the superhero community to essentially monitor them, right? So think of it as superhuman registration from Civil War before the events of Civil War. Now, something else to understand here is that there was a bit of legitimate experimenting going on here by Grunewald with the question of like, could we potentially replace Steve Rogers as Captain America and make somebody else the character, right? Like what if that is kind of a added benefit of what we're doing here, which is not uncommon. You oftentimes see Marvel taking an existing hero and replacing them with somebody else to see how people respond to it. A really good example is when Jane Foster became Thor under Jason Aaron, which was probably one of the best Thor runs of all time. I don't care what anybody says. And so what you ended up finding out here in Captain America issue number 332 going into 333 and 334 was that the Red Skull had actually been manipulating the commission on superhero activities to get Steve Rogers out. And so what this meant was that with the Red Skull becoming successful, Steve Rogers was replaced by John Walker. The problem with this is that John Walker was far more of an extreme version of Captain America than Steve Rogers was, going so far as to like intentionally inflict harm among other people. People. And so the, the result is that where you ended up having uh, the actions of John Walker being exposed publicly, people realizing that, that he was just far too extreme of a Captain America, followed by Steve Rogers kind of changing his name to the Captain, and then the two of them teaming up and basically defeating the Red Skull. It was deemed that John Walker was just too extreme to be Captain America. And so really in this kind of 10 part epic between Captain America 341 and 351, John Walker was ultimately removed from the role of, of Captain America and it was given back to Steve Rogers. Now, a lot of this came by way of letters pages, things like that, where fans basically write in and Marvel publishes those. And a lot of fans just wanted Steve Rogers to be Captain America, right? It's just the way of things. Even if he wasn't necessarily the most popular character 
that Marvel had going at the time, there was a kind of familiarity among fans who either didn't like change, enjoy the status quo, or fans who were coming into comics for the first time and seeing that like Steve Rogers was Captain America, that Peter Parker was Spider-Man, right? That Professor Xavier was the leader of the X-Men. There was this kind of expectation that, you know, given whatever sources brought them into comics, that they would see those characters depicted in comic books. And so I wouldn't say that John Walker playing the role of Captain America was a catastrophic failure, but I will say it was one of these instances when where Mark Grunewald and Marvel kind of realized, okay, there really isn't a whole lot of room here to replace Steve Rogers <laughs> with somebody else in the role of Captain America. That would come later with Bucky Barnes and Sam Wilson. Now, following this, something to understand is that where Mark Grunewald had initially taken over the writing duties of Captain America, at that point in time, uh, Jim Shooter was editor-in-chief of Marvel, right? And so Jim Shooter kind of ran Marvel with an iron fist. And so the idea of, hey, like, if you're going to create villains that belong to Captain America, like, they belong to him, right? And that's it. You don't ever really change it up. Tom DeFalco was a lot more lenient with regards to how he handled uh, Marvel characters and was even really on par with the idea of, like, switching things around. And the reason why this mattered is because really with this initial, I guess, ousting of John Walker as Steve Rogers, nobody really knew what to do with him. And so he did appear about 10 issues later in Captain America 354, uh, where he kind of popped back up as US agent and he was facing off against the Iron Monger, but he had a completely different look than what we were familiar with. Instead, he had a whole new costume, his shield had been shifted, like the, the colors, the design and everything was just different from the one that we were used to. But following this appearance, he was ultimately rolled over into Avengers West Coast. Now, a little bit of history here, the Avengers West Coast team was a team that was created, one by Marvel, uh, as just kind of an ancillary, sort of what if we can expand the Avengers roster, but within comics was formed as a necessity. So the way that played out is when Jim Shooter was editor-in-chief and he orchestrated the original Secret Wars story due to a, a potential brand deal between Marvel and Mattel, you had the main Avengers team, which was basically whisked away to Battle World by the Beyonder to face off against the various villains that had been brought there as well. What it essentially meant is that Earth didn't really have a superhero team in the form of an Avengers team protecting it. And so with the Vision being one of the individuals who was left behind, what he actually ended up realizing is that there was an enemy approaching Earth called the Dire Wraiths, who were basically just an offshoot of the Scrolls. But if they were to arrive on Earth, there'd be nobody there to keep it safe. And with X-Factor essentially being part of the original Secret Wars, along with some of the more popular X-Men being there, then there wouldn't really be a whole lot of protection. And so he formed an ancillary Avengers team on the West Coast to basically be a backup team in case the, the main Avengers team itself was unavailable. Now, the reality is that Marvel was just kind of experimenting and just seeing, you know, what all was there. But the other part of this is that with the Commission on Superhuman Activities, while the Avengers West Coast team was relatively popular within Marvel Comics, by the time the commission became a thing, what you ended up having was them basically stating if the Avengers West Coast team is going to function in the United States, then it has to do so with government oversight. And so the character of John Walker as US agent was forced onto the Avengers West Coast team, which led to people like Hawkeye and I believe Mockingbird quitting out of protest. But the, the, the cool thing about this is that where there was a lot of, you know, disdain for the idea of the federal government involving itself in the affairs of the Avengers West Coast team, ultimately the way that John Walker was written by John Byrne was very, very intriguing, right? So the way that this was done was one of these things where it was kind of him in some degree making up atonement for his past actions when he was Captain America, but also being somewhat of a vigilante guy. But where the Avengers West Coast run was coming to a rapid end in the sense that like it would end with issue number 46. So literally two issues after John Walker was thrown onto the team, by all standards of measurement, he effectively became the backbone of the Avengers West Coast team, right? He was their own miniature version of Captain America. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people see John Walker as kind of a poor man's Captain America, because he, I wouldn't say he's a cheap knockoff, or maybe he kind of is, but he was kind of the Avengers West Coast's own little version of Steve Rogers. And so what ended up happening is that with Avengers West Coast coming to an end, John Byrne basically departing, and then uh, Dan Abnett and Andy Landing taking up the launch of Forceworks, you essentially had Iron Man creating his quote unquote own superhero team. Some people call it like a, an unofficial version of the Avengers, some people don't. But the important thing about Forceworks is that initially John Walker didn't want to join. He didn't want to be part of the team. He really saw it as, as the idea of the Avengers West Coast kind of disbanding as sort of a failing on his own personal part. And so ultimately he was convinced by Scarlet Witch to join. And that was a way for Marvel to kind of rework his character yet again, to give him a new costume, to give him an energy shield, different things along those lines. And for the most part, the entire run of Forceworks as he was a part of it was cool, right? It was cool to see him leading this field team and almost making up for the past mistakes that he'd engaged in. You also saw some of his former villains and even teammates coming back. You saw him coming into conflict with a power broker yet again, things along those lines. And then ultimately his involvement with the commission, which has kind of been this holdover ever since the old Mark Grunewald days, was 
basically cut off in its entirety when he ended up getting into a conflict with War Machine and Hawkeye uh, during Force Works issue number 12, where the series was essentially wrapping up. I mean, technically it ran for 22 issues, but it might as well have been finished by issue number 12. I mean, the series was, <laughs> it wasn't that great by the time it was done. But following that, with Force Works basically coming to an end more or less in the mid 1990s, the reality of US Agent is he just ended up becoming one of those characters who just kind of bounced around because Marvel never really knew what to do with him. They never really knew exactly what to do with this character. There was a point when he became part of a group called the Jury, right? Which was basically just kind of this, this vigilante group that was led by a guy named Edward Cord. Uh, and he got into a, to a battle with the Thunderbolts. The Thunderbolts series was hugely popular. It ran for like 81 issues all the way up to 2003. But you just saw him kind of move around from place to place and shift from team to team. I would say some of the most notable instances of his time uh, during this, this period was when he became part of a group called Stars, which was basically organized by Valerie Cooper and is called the Superhuman Tactical Activities Response Squad. This was basically just a government sanctioned team that served the purpose, at least non-mutant team, that was X-Factor at the time, but it was a non-mutant government sanctioned team that served the purpose of dealing with various superhuman threats that existed out there. The reality is that it may there may have been instances when the group had to face off against superheroes. And that's the reason why John Walker was inducted as part of the team is that while he was to a degree a hero, he was more of an anti-hero than anything else. And so by being part of the Stars team, sometimes he was a good guy, sometimes he was a bad guy. It depended on the situation that he was in. And that kind of bouncing back and forth became a mainstay of his character. One of the notable instances of this was during the events of Civil War, when he actually sided in favor of superhuman registration and ultimately faced off against the forces of Captain America and his secret Avengers. But again, that's one of the things that was sort of intriguing about him is that he just sort of moved and gravitated. But I will say, probably one of the single most important moments of his character really came by way of the, really the lead up to the events of Secret Empire. And the reason why is because during that point in time, during Rick Remender's run on Captain America, by and large, a lot of work had been done with Steve Rogers leading up to that, specifically during Ed Brubaker's run. Ed Brubaker had brought back Bucky Barnes, who had been gone from the Marvel landscape for years and years and years. Um, Ed Brubaker had actually changed up a lot of the history there. So in the older stories by Marvel Comics, when Captain America was fighting against communists, and then there was no real continuity there in terms of how he could be frozen in ice, but fight against communists at the same time, that he shifted that up and say that, that essentially any version of Captain America and Bucky Barnes that you saw after the end of World War II were basically stand-ins. They were people pretending to be Captain America because nobody really knew where Steve Rogers was. They assumed that he was he was killed in action. And so Rick Remender basically came back in towards the end of his run and basically had a story called The Nail where Steve Rogers lost the super soldier serum. It was essentially taken away from his body and he just aged up into an old man. And so what this meant was that the stage was effectively set for a new Captain America. Bucky Barnes had already been Captain America at one point in time following the death of Steve Rogers or the perceived death of Steve Rogers after the events of Civil War. And so you couldn't really do the same gag twice. And so what Rick Remender did is he wrote all new, all different Captain America where Sam Wilson became the new, the new Captain America character. Now, the reality of this is that Sam Wilson, the way he was written at the time, was largely overwhelmed by his role of, of being the Captain America-esque character because the reality was Steve Rogers was really supposed to be, or really the Captain America character was supposed to be beholden to a series of ideologies without any particular bias towards any particular thing, right? So long as those ideologies uh, embody what is in effect truth, justice in the American way, then Captain America was always in the good. The way this played out though, was you actually had a story that took place in Captain America, Sam Wilson issue number 12, where you in effect had uh, Sam Wilson facing off against what were called the Americops. Now the Americops were a group created by a guy named Paul Keen that was originally designed to be a kind of uh, accompaniment to existing police officers to face off against, you know, whatever threats may overwhelm cops. The truth about it is that the Americops just ended up profiling and cracking down hard on poor minorities in America. And so Sam Wilson, who was being written as a Captain America that was more in line with what were in effect ideologies that were focused on more progressive ideals and standing up for minorities, ended up coming into conflict with the Americops. And the way this was, was sort of orchestrated, the way this was depicted to John Walker was by a combination of Paul Keene and, uh, and Tom Harold, who was a Texas senator in Manhattan. And they essentially painted this picture that, uh, that that Sam Wilson was not fit for the shield. That Sam Wilson, while he was largely rejected by the American people, by virtue of his actions facing off against the cops, was being depicted as a guy who was quote unquote anti-American, right? He was attacking the police. Now, US agent immediately saw right through this, right? The way that he was written was what well, he immediately saw right through this and he called the bluff and said, no, like I'm not doing that. I'm not going out there to confront Sam Wilson and taking the shield away from him because he's standing up for people who are being abused by what is in effect a corrupt police force. And so this led to Steve Rogers showing up 
and then basically asking US agent to go and get the shield from Sam Wilson because he's obviously not qualified to be Captain America. Now, the big question that a lot of people had at this point in time was why would that play out, right? Why would we have this version of Captain America, this version of Steve Rogers doing that? Now, the reality is Nick Spencer was the one who was writing Captain America at this point in time with regards to Sam Wilson facing off against the, the Americots and so on. And while there was a, a, was a very, a very big rift among Captain America fans as to whether or not Nick Spencer's run was good, I thought it was fantastic. It's probably the single greatest Captain America run that anybody's ever written. Uh, but this basically revealed the idea that during the events of Avengers standoff, that the Red Skull had managed to get his hands on a cosmic cube that had kind of reformed itself into a young girl. And then he used that power to rewrite all of Steve Rogers' history and effectively established that Steve Rogers has always been a Hydra agent. And so with that being the case, Steve Rogers going in here and then orchestrating a conflict between US agent and Sam Wilson, and then having US agent try to take the, the, the shield from Sam Wilson was designed to basically be a distraction, which would essentially allow him and the rest of Hydra to conquer Washington, D.C. through a series of really subterfuge missions and tricking the government and, and even the superhero community itself, and then ultimately conquering the United States, which is exactly what Captain America did during the events of Secret Empire. It, he basically conquered America, and it's probably one of the best stories ever. But more recently with U.S. Agent, you've basically seen Marvel relaunching him and going through and essentially giving us like a, a kind of a rework of his origin story. I will say it's written by Christopher Priest. It's pretty good. But the problem Christopher Priest has is he writes out of time. So like he'll give you what's going on right now. Then he'll jump forward five months. Then he'll jump back a year and a half. Then he'll jump forward by like three weeks. Then he'll go back like like 15 years ago. It's, it's really, really confusing. And it can really, really throw you off. It certainly reads better in trade, I will say. But at the moment, you know, that's kind of the nature of US agent, right? John Walker was in effect a guy who was brought in to be a replacement Captain America. He proved to be too extreme. He was involved in the, the West Coast Avengers team as basically a field head uh, leading the team itself. He ultimately became part of Iron Man's own little Avengers slash Force Works teams, and then just kind of bounced around Marvel Comics ever since with nobody really having any idea what to do with them. So uh, with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.